verse 20, Rejoice over her, thou heaven. So God is saying, up in heaven, you can rejoice over the destruction of Babylon. Wow! Uh, any holy apostles and prophets. Notice that New Testament apostles, who are obviously now holy up in heaven, and prophets during the Old Testament, and this can include some in the New Testament, basically dispensations of all time, they're rejoicing over the destruction of Babylon. Okay, now the question is, well, how can this make sense if this was referring to United States of America? Definitely not. But it can make more sense if it's Rome, because there were apostles and prophets existing during the time of Rome. How about that? But if we were going to include saints of all time, this is not just some, this is holy apostles and prophets of all time, then who can we apply this to? about Babylon. Why remember Genesis chapter 10, I mentioned to you, Nimrod and Semiramis started Babylon. Babel. Remember Revelation 17, Babylon is not known as a city, it's a spiritual female demon, the whore. Remember, cities that are known as evil and judged by God, they will have a demonic spirit behind them. That's something important to understand. So what God is referring to over here is this spiritual Babylonian wicked system that's been going throughout nearly all dispensations that you can think of because of Nimrod's Babylon. Now think about it. This is why United States America cannot, it doesn't make a lot of sense that it's more of United States of America. What city or aka religious system is known to be the Babylon system? S Semiramis Nimrod. Semiramis is known as a mother and child figure. Semiramis Tammuz or to the Catholics, the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. How about that? Martin Luther, that's why he called the Roman Catholic Church system Babylon. That's why Protestant reformers and Great Awakening Revival preachers, when they talked about Babylon, they knew what it was. It was referring to the Roman Catholic Church. Why this makes a lot more sense, that's a Roman Catholic Church. Notice over here that all these believers throughout all time, they're rejoicing over the destruction of Babylon. For God hath avenged you on her. God avenged the apostles and prophets, people of all time, of Babylon's corrupt system. Because we got to understand Babylon's corrupt system is not just the Roman Catholic Church time. No, this is of all time. Nimrod and Semiramis, Semiramis's spiritual Babylonian system has corrupted and hurt so many people that different cultures and cities around the world adopted it's Babylonian practices. I mean, look at the mother-child figure or even a mother deity figure that's uh, noticed throughout the whole world. Uh, you got China, and then you got the ancient time periods, Venus, and then Zeus, etc., etc. And yes, we can even include the United States of America with the Statue of Liberty and Jerusalem. Because this Babylonian system just infected not just one not just one United States of America or just one Jerusalem. No, this is a spiritual system that corrupted everything worldwide. It corrupted everybody worldwide. And if we're going to think of the best candidate of the city, because God's looking only at one city here, then it would be the Roman Catholic Church. That's the most befitting out of every city. Sure, you can find some Babylonian things within Jerusalem, America, Mecca, or a lot of other different religions too, or cities around the world, but it's only a part of it. Every, descriptive, every description at Revelation 17, 18 fits to a T with Roman Catholic Church. And not only that, some of the descriptions in Revelation 17, 18 actually contradicts for other candidate cities outside of the Roman Catholic Church. So there's no other better candidate for Babylon than the Roman Catholic Church system. 
Okay, now that we understand that, Matthew, that's why it makes sense that Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said to the Pharisee Sadducees and to Jerusalem that they were the ones held accountable for the blood of the prophets and for persecution of Christians. Now, why would Jesus put all the blame on the Jewish religious leaders? Why would he do that? The reason why is because of the Babylonian system. It makes so much sense then why when Babylon burns at Revelation 18, everybody of all times rejoicing because of this wicked system who has shed blood. So they're held the blame for it. Wow, imagine these Jewish religious leaders who are known as twofold more the child of hell than yourselves in Matthew 23. They receive that blame just because of joining the Babylon system. Which makes sense at Revelation 18, God's fiery judgment is double, which we read at Revelation 18. That matches with Matthew 23 of twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. That's why it makes so much sense at Revelation 18, God says to come out of her my people and receive not her plagues. See, anyone who partakes in this Babylonian system receives this greater damnation and judgment. That's why it is Bible-believing Christians or any Christian have to be strongly anti-Catholic. And I'm very sad to say, but that's the reason why Ravi Zacharias, I had to address his errors. Because he's not strongly anti-Catholic. Now, I'm not saying that he's for the Catholic Church and he'll point out the wrong doctrine, but he is not strongly anti-Catholic. Well, you have to be very strong in anti-Catholicism because of based off Revelation 18, the corrupt Babylonian system that receives double damnation. Why would Zacharias, of all things, uh, word it? If you, if you doubt me, just go to his website and they talk about their company, their beliefs, that they would say that they, are, uh, that they believe in Holy Catholic Church. Of all things, why would they say that? And then they put a disclaimer there, that way they can please all sides, that what we mean by Catholic is not the Catholic religion, but basically the universal church. Okay, well, if he simply meant that, then why couldn't he just simply say the universal whole church? Why does he have to say the word Catholic? See, it shows that there's this uh, weakness and sympathy toward it, especially uh, even if you look at his YouTube video, which is infamous, Is the Catholic Church a Cult?, Zacharias, I mean, he just went backwards and forwards. He danced around the issue. Now, if you think that he's just being, giving an intellectual, honest answer, then let's even give him that benefit of the doubt. Why would he start it off with a nervous laughter and the whole audience starting out with a nervous laughter when he was asked if the Catholic Church is a cult and why was it dropped from uh, the Kingdom of the Cults book that he's responsible as general editor? And then Zacharias would say, it's like a question, would you like to be axed or hanged? Huh? It's as if he's getting pressure from them and hurt. Now, I hope that people really understand why I'm giving, uh, I'm trying to give all these convincing examples so that they can see that, look, we ha if, if a great man of God, I don't deny he's a great man of God, in apologetics, the Lord mightily used him, but if... But if someone who has such high value, who's supposed to be a good representation of Christian apologetics, if a man like that is what a lot of people looked up to, can fall to something where there is hardly any strong anti-Catholic stance, then that is something Christians, sh shouldn't that be something that Christians should be troubled about when a great representative example messes up like that, doesn't show that. It should be very, very troubling. Okay, but verse 20, God saying that, notice over here that we can rejoice over the destruction of Babylon. Now, that's very, very strange. If you look at Romans chapter 12, Christians are not supposed to rejoice or to be happy over the destruction of enemies. In fact, we're supposed to show them goodness. Now, that may be hard for Christians. However, Romans 12 continues that the more we show them goodness rather than 
uh, rejoicing or reveling or seeking vengeance for ourselves, the greater their damnation is. God does the vengeance. Romans 12 says, vengeance is mine. Which makes sense at verse 20, God hath avenged you on her. See that? So it's not us seeking vengeance, it's God. But now it comes down to a troubling issue where there are some people who do not believe in dispensationalism. And then they rejoice and then ruin their testimony saying, I'm so glad about the judgment of God with Hurricane Katrina or with the Orlando shooting where there were sodomites being killed. Thank God. I wish Obama is dead. I pray for him to die. And they take the impeccatory prayers of David, which is Old Testament dispensation. That's not New Testament dispensation. New Testament dispensation, we're forbidden for, to do that. We're supposed to feed, show goodness toward our enemies. So then some of these people would use Revelation 18.20 to say, see, it's justified where we be happy and revel about uh, lost people, unbelievers dying or being judged by God. Well, here's the thing, is that the key thing how we can tell if this is righteous joy or if this is fleshly joy is this. The key answer is, what is your first reaction if, uh, if on what would happen to your enemy? The first reaction would be that you would want your enemy to repent and the Lord show him goodness and forgiveness. Or would your first reaction be concerning about, would you prioritize more that God would judge the individual and kill the person? Which one would you prefer? If you're truly spiritual of God, I'll tell you what God would prefer. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not willing on what? That any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Romans chapter 2, God shows more goodness to unbelievers so that they can be repented, so that they can repent. However, if they don't, then they get greater damnation and judgment, which makes sense with Babylon. God has shown uh, the people, the unbelievers, much grace and mercy in time, so that he, because he wants them to repent. That's why he says, come out of her, my people, that you don't partake in the plagues at Revelation 18. That's what God would prefer, not judgment, not judgment. And that's why they received double damnation and double judgment, according to Romans 2, because God showed them goodness and they did not repent. So that shows if, you know, if you're fleshly or spiritual over there. Another thing is this. Another thing is, I mean, your first, uh, rea I mean, your first reaction we can see over there is if, we, if you seek vengeance or if you seek them to repent. And then depending on your reaction, then we can truly tell if you're fleshly or you're spiritual. See that? There is a rejoicing over about the destruction, but wouldn't it be better concentrated in this way? That way we can see if you're truly spiritual or not. Is it more spiritual where you're rejoicing on, yeah, those unbelievers should burn and perish and they're destroyed? Or would it be more spiritual and godly where we can see that the rejoicing is in the fact that God, I am happy that these people are destroyed, that they're being judged, these unbelievers. Why? Why? Oh, so I can feel good? No. See, then we know that's fleshly. They, why do you rejoice over their destruction? Because they're damning more souls to hell, Father. So that deception will not spread. So that false doctrine won't spread. And by the way, Heavenly Father... I would prefer, I would prefer that they would repent and get right with you and they would go to heaven with me. Then we can see that your rejoicing over the destruction is godly or not. That's very plain. Okay, verse 21, and then we can close it off here. And a mighty angel, okay, so that's self-explanatory. There's an angel who's very mighty and strong, took up a stone like a great millstone. So he takes a stone that's a millstone. Okay, a big millstone, and cast it into the sea. So he throws it into the sea. Now look at this, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down. So he says that thus, therefore, what's going to happen? Therefore, what? Like this millstone sinking into the sea, that this great city Babylon is going to be violently 
going down the sea, thrown down into the sea, and obviously what's going to happen, and shall be found no more at all. So you can't see it anymore. Now this gives an interesting theory. An interesting theory is this, is that if you compare that with the book of Matthew, Jesus says that if you offend these little ones, it's better that you had a millstone hang around your neck and cast into the sea. What did he mean by that? If you keep reading over there, he talks about hell. Quite often, worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. That's what he says. Now, I think that's Mark chapter 9, excuse me, not Matthew 9. But anyway, some of you can find what it, wherever that passage is in the four Gospels. But the point is, is that this millstone sinking into the sea is likened to hell. Huh. Uh, remember, I mentioned in previous Revelation studies, when we went to the book of Isaiah, if I recall, where it talks about Babylon being judged by God in end times, and that went hand in hand with Revelation 18. And then God described, the uh, when God talked about the destru destruction of Babylon, he mentioned about a millstone. Ah, it goes hand in hand. Now, Remember the previous wordings I mentioned to remember in Revelation 18 about verse 19, made desolate, verse 18, smoke of her burning? It's like hell references here. Not only that, it mentioned about double her judgment at Revelation 18. Kind of matches with Matthew 23, about twofold more the child of hell. Uh, it's burned with fire, just like hell fire. Now let's uh, use our heads over here and connect the dots over here. Sodom and Gomorrah, it was destroyed by fire and brimstone. That sounds like hell. Revelation 21, 8, fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now you might recall what I taught about Sodom and Gomorrah is that I taught that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed by hell fire and is sunk down into hell. And then it was found no more. Why? This sounds like Revelation 18. So if hell comes down from below, it, it, it's, it does obviously scientific natural activity where volcanoes were going to have to spurt out or fire is going to have to spurt out from below. And thus, just like vol volcano that spores out lava and that lava comes from hell, it rains down fire and brimstone. Wow, wow, wow. And it does the same thing with Babylon, and it sinks down like a millstone, and it shall be found no more at all, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now that sounds like an interesting theory to think about.